two slides, two first slides, are meant just to remind you very briefly about the aging as a global phenomenon, and also, in that sense, in, in, an increasing number of people who are care dependent, who are disabled, or who are frail. And logically, the impact or the proportion of this uh, population at surgical departments of our hospitals is all. So in particular, uh, cardiothoracic department, orthopedic surgery department, facing a lot of uh, older patients, uh, and some of them uh, might be disabled or frail. So in that sense, it's not always easy for the treating surgeon to make a decision uh, how far is he going to go with the proposed treatment, which is actually uh, uh, evidence-based in younger and more capable populations. But the experience and the expertise and the evidence with regard to really very frail populations is lacking. So what we are uh, applying and what are we are proposing, uh, not only in, uh, in the available evidence, but also in daily practice, is a three-step approach. Very simple three-step approach. In the first instance, uh, is the intention to, to, to stratify a little bit, to differentiate a little bit between the patients who are old but, but capable and in a good shape and patients who are uh, care dependent and uh, possibly frail. Once we have done that very first step of the assessment, we proceed in the population which appears frail or which might be frail with more comprehensive and more detailed uh, geriatric assessment in order to fine-tune a little bit with the surgeon to which extent the planned intervention uh, can take place. And finally, as the third step, a very important step, also in these patients who are uh, care-dependent and possibly frail, we should apply certain interventions to stabilize the situation and to avoid further deterioration. There exist in the literature many screening instruments for frailty. I'm not going to go into detail, but what I'm going to underline is, is uh, just uh, the following. It is important to note that the following components of the ideal screening tool uh, are important. Fatigue reported by the patient, him or herself, physical performance, walking capacity, number of associated diseases, comorbidities, and also nutritional state. Uh, Professor Benetos addressed that aspect, and it is really an important one. Which are the essential factors in a frailty instrument? There are eight, and I'm uh, going very briefly to, uh, to sum up uh, uh, all of them, but I'm not going uh, into detail with regard to operationalization of each of those aspects. So nutritional aspect, and nutritional status, as I just uh, said, um, physical activity, mobility, uh, energy, the feeling of energy, strength, muscle strength, cognition, mood, but also, not to be forgotten, social relations and social support. Very important. So, um, as previously said by Professor Martin, all the slides will uh, be at your disposal, so you can go into detail um, with regard to operationalization of, um, of all these aspects. If we, if we try to summarize the literature with regard to essential factors in the frailty instrument, uh, then we see that the large majority of the studies and instruments um, uh, has focused on physical function. But still, the other aspects uh, have been explored, but to a much less extent. Uh, so again, which uh, screening uh, instrument are you going to choose? Uh, that one that covers all the aspects which I mentioned by preference. So you see the list. Frailty index is one of uh, those. Uh, uh, or, excuse me, you can choose an instrument that at least covers the three uh, important components of a frailty instrument, namely physical, psychological, 
and social. And I'm just going to illustrate how we work in our daily practice by using uh, the following example of Groningen Frailty Indicator, because in our setting, it's a Dutch part speaking of Belgium, it's a, it's, a, it's a Dutch instrument, so it's a very easy applicable. But not only because of the language, because of its simplicity, uh, and uh, also uh, usefulness. So it has 15 questions, very, uh, very simple questions, which you can, or the patient can uh, answer, uh, let's say, in several minutes of time. And if you have a, a score of four or more, then you already, at that moment, have an indication of possible frailty. So at that moment, you have an indication that you go, that you, that you should go a step further with your uh, with your assessment. And the next step in our uh, three-step plan is indeed comprehensive geriatric assessment. And for the sake of completeness, I'm giving you here the, the definition. It's a multidimensional uh, interdisciplinary diagnostic process focused on determining of a frail older person's medical, psychological, and functional capability in order to develop a coordinated and integrated plan, very important terms, coordinated and integrated plan for treatment and long-term follow-up. So who is going to, to benefit uh, most from CGA? Not each and every uh, older person, but the people who are vulnerable with limited homeostasis, with active multimorbidity, active presence of several uh, diseases, uh, also people who might have a typical clinical presentation of the disease, modified pharmacokinetics due to age, due to uh, multimorbidity, risk of functional deterioration, risk of deficient diet, tendency to inactivity, a very important one, and also psychosocial problems and isolation. Here, schematically, so comprehensive uh, ger geriatric assessment, we can offer it to each and every one, but we are going to stratify uh, people who are too well to benefit, so we uh, are going to leave them out of the consideration. Those who are too sick or in a palliative, really palliative uh, setting of the care, we are also not going to assess. And in our communication with surgeon, we would prefer purely symptomatic treatment for this group of the patients, but for the group there in between, we are going fully for a comprehensive geriatric assessment and tailoring of the therapy and the treatment of the individual patients. Very briefly, which are the domains of comprehensive geriatric assessments? They are different, medical condition of the patient, functional condition, very important, both in terms of physical and social, cognitive affective, presence of depression, dementia. Social support, is the patient alone at home or does he uh, have any uh, caregivers at home, informal caregivers, which are environmental factors, which are economic factors, is there any economic deprivation, isolation, and what is the quality of life of the patient. So it's uh, uh, briefly spoken the concept within uh, which the assessment has to take place. What is the essential? That you have to use validated instruments. Don't have time to go into detail, but for each of these aspects, there are plenty of validated instruments. And what is also essential, always to use the same battery of instruments in your own institution, because different institutions, different hospitals, different countries might use different instruments. There is nothing uh, bad about that, but you in your own institution, in your department, uh, should preferably use always the same battery in order to be able to follow up the evolution of the individual patient. So, very briefly, medical issues. Are there any major precipitating factors for hospitalization, which is the reason for admission? <clears throat> In other words, uh, also uh, medical comorbidities associated, but not very active uh, symptoms and diseases at that very moment have to be assessed. And also purely preoperative assessment has to it has to take place, uh, preferably, of course, uh, in, in collaboration with anesthesiologist. Then, with regard to preoperative risk assessment, we have, all together as a team, to determine patients' risk factors, 
to assess functional level, um, to, to assess potential benefit of, of, of the intervention, and also, finally, surgical risk of procedure. Let's say an ophthalmological intervention is not the same as a, as a, a hip fracture intervention of heart transplantation, so you have to stratify also the risk of procedure. How we apply it in, in our daily practice with regard to functional assessment, we, of course, uh, pay attention to gait and mobility. Is the patient mobile enough? What about sensory assessment? What about activities of daily living? Is he uh, independent enough to perform activities of daily living? Uh, what about instrumental activities of daily living? I'm going to give you an example in a moment. What about cognitive assessment? Is the patient uh, capable to make decision with regard to the operation himself or herself. And finally, very important, very important aspect in, uh, in the context of preoperative assessment is medication review. So, with regard to the functional assessment, very pragmatically, what is the ambulatory status of the patient? Is he mobile enough? Does he need any assistive device? Um, uh, is there any history of recent falls? And uh, if you are not certain, of, if the patient is not certain, you can perform the very simply uh, uh, composed time up and go test. Just ask the patient to come out his chair without any support, uh, to walk three meters and to come back. And uh, you, measure the, you measure the time. And if it's 12 seconds or less, there is no problem. If uh, it's uh, longer than 12 seconds, uh, there is a point of attention, so you go further in your, in your assessment. Why is that important? I'm just very, very briefly showing you our, uh, the results of our own group in which we, uh, in which we uh, have shown that actually the functional status uh, of the patient, of the person initially, Baseline is predictive, uh, is predictive in terms of mortality, uh, but also uh, after a period of time, after three years of time, it remains, uh, it remains predictive. So people who uh, function less at the baseline will have a higher risk of mortality uh, within a period of time. Also sensory deficit, just briefly to illustrate here that uh, balance impairment is a very prevalent and important. And when we spoke about functional assessment, activities of daily living, there are summed up here for your information, bathing, the last one in the row, is very important because if the patient is capable of taking bath him or herself, then uh, I would say uh, most probably he would be able to perform other activities of daily living. So just to simplify the way of your assessment. The same with regard to instrumental activities of daily life. There are two which are uh, important and very useful, using the telephone and handling money. If the patient is uh, capable of doing this without much support, then you can rely on his, uh, on his functional uh, capacity. Cognitive assessment, also very briefly, two very short instruments. One of them is Minicom. So you let the patient draw um, a clock and you ask him to repeat three simple words. And then, uh, depending on the response, you can uh, uh, have an indication whether you should proceed with further cognitive assessment. Short portable mental status questionnaire, 10. 10 very simple questions, I'm not going to go into detail, but just in a daily conversation, you can ask some of the, the, these details. Decision-making capacity is also very important in terms of involving, involving the person of the patient, him or herself, in taking decision. If the patient is not capable of doing this, then you already have a, an, an important uh, remark with regard whether to perform surgery, but if you decide so, then you can identify surrogate or proxy, uh, mostly family member or spouse, who uh, can take decision on behalf of the patient. Why it's so important to perform that uh, functional and cognitive assessment? Because there is clearly a link between uh, 
lower performance and increased mortality, increased length of stay, increased risk of medical complications, and also difficulty with rehabilitation program, and also uh, by extrapolation uh, in terms of financial aspects. Medication review is a really an essential part of the assessment in terms of reconciliation to be sure what medication really the patient is taking. And in a second step, to see are there any, are there any drugs there which are not appropriate for that patient. There are many instruments. I'm going to talk about this uh, later on this afternoon. There are many instruments, uh, implicit or so-called explicit criteria, and one of the explicit criteria are so-called stop-start criteria, also endorsed by our, our society. These are lists of drugs and conditions which are appropriate or less appropriate for older patients. So you have to apply such a list, or you might apply such a list to see to which extent uh, the pharmacotherapy is appropriate in our very patient. Once we have a picture, so I remind you on, on, on the three-step plan, so screening where necessary assessment in depth, and the third one is a tailored plan with regard to the individual patient. And you can see there are different aspects with regard to functional loss, mobility and falls, nutrition, incontinence, polypharmacy, mood and depression, loneliness, cognitive problems, and also lack of informal care support. It has been extensively illustrated in the literature that comprehensive genetic assessment can increase a patient's likelihood of being alive and, and, in their own, and stay in their own home uh, at up to 12 months, which, which is a really a great advantage. But what, what are the conditions uh, under which the comprehensive genetic assessment should be uh, should be performed uh, in a multidisciplinary team? And if we do it like this, and if we link our the results of our geriatric evaluation with multidisciplinary intervention and long-term care management, then uh, there is improvement, a possible improvement of functional status, quality of life, uh, length of hospital stay, and also rates of readmission and institutionalization. So the very final one, the comprehensive genetic assessment, means an added value for older patients, provided that the assessment is taken in its totality, where necessary, in the, in the particular group of patients, and also is followed by recommendations and follow-up. And I stop here, two minutes long.